Last week's elections to the Northern Ireland Assembly were historic. That's because for the first time ever, the party with the largest share of votes and the largest number of seats is one in favour of Irish unification. As you can see, Sinn Féin came first both in terms of votes and seats, with 29% of the popular vote and 27 of the 90 seats in the Northern Ireland Assembly. The DUP fell back to 25 seats, that's three down on their 2017 result, and the Alliance Party won 17, up from eight last time. As those results came in, the BBC's Lewis Goodall explained their significance in this clip, which has since gone viral. Sinn Féin, a nationalist party, has topped the poll. That has never happened before in the 101-year history of Northern Ireland's existence. Northern Ireland was literally designed, its borders were designed so that that wouldn't happen, so that there would be an inbuilt unionist majority. And indeed, if you top up the unionist parties, they're still on top. If you put the DUP together and you put the UUP together and you put the TUV uh, together, a relatively new party, they still have a plurality of the votes. But the fact that you have a nationalist party coming top really does transform the political landscape in Northern Ireland, not least because, theoretically, if there is going to be an executive, Sinn Féin will have the right to nominate a first minister. Now, to an untrained ear, that explanation might have sounded fairly anodyne, but it got 1.4 million views and over a thousand quote tweets. One of those was from Sinn Féin MP Chris Hazard. He tweeted, BBC finally acknowledging that the partition of Ireland and the subsequent creation of the northern state was an imperialist instrument that relied upon the subjugation of the rights of citizens. Journalist Brian Whelan tweeted this, Wow! You're not supposed to say it, BBC acknowledging gerrymandering. The specific quote that provoked comment in the clip was Goodall saying, Northern Ireland was literally designed, its borders were designed, so that a nationalist majority wouldn't happen. That's a reference to the partition of Ireland in 1920. Earlier today, I spoke to Dan Finn, Jacobin Features editor and an expert on Northern Irish history and politics. And I asked him why Goodall's comments were so notable. Well, that comment by Lewis Goodall is unquestionably true and accurate, and it's not something that would be disputed by any historian who's looked at the way that the partition settlement came about at the beginning of the 1920s. There was no dispute at the time about that, and it was something that was freely stated and publicly stated by unionist political leaders that what they had sought from the negotiations and the Anglo-Irish Treaty and the aftermath of that was the largest possible geographical area that would still have a rock-solid Protestant and Unionist majority. There was never any dispute about that. And not only was the external structure of Northern Ireland, so to speak, the way the line was drawn on the map, designed to have a permanent inbuilt Unionist majority, but for the next 50 years up until the early 1970s, the internal structure of government as well through the regional parliament was also designed to secure majority rule. So in a sense, what Lewis Goodall was saying there is not any revelation. It will be accepted by any historian, any scholar who has looked at the events of a century ago, including people who believe that partition was justified or that partition was inevitable or that it was the best of a bad deal in, in some shape or form. So I would say what is significant about it, especially in the current context, is that it is reminding people of the fact that the way Northern Ireland was created and constituted in the first place a century ago, it wasn't some kind of natural or organic process. It didn't stem inevitably and ineluctably from history. It was a choice that was made by political leaders and political leadership teams. The reaction on, on Twitter has suggested that this sort of inbuilt by design um, unionist majority is, is somehow sinister. And I'm, I'm not saying that's not the case, but it does, I think, need some expansion because one might assume that whenever you have partition, the border will naturally fall so that on one side of the border, you have a, a majority of, of one ethnicity or one religious group. And on the other side, you have a majority of the other um, ethnic or, or religious group. The partition of India would be an example here. So it's, it was by design that, that Pakistan had a, had a Muslim majority and that India had a Hindu majority. It was because the regions which had a majority of Hindus went to India. The regions that had a majority of, of Muslims went to, to Pakistan. Is that what's happened here or, or is that sort of a, a 
a bad analogy to, to, to compare what happened in Ireland to, to the partition of India? There was no sense on the part of the British political class back then that there was a general right to self-determination. And that did certainly influence the way that Northern Ireland was set up, because even if you do accept um, the argument in principle that the Unionists in the North East had a right to decide that they should not be part of an independent Irish state, the way that the border was actually drawn meant that there was a nationalist minority inside what became Northern Ireland that was proportionately larger than would have been the Unionist minority across the whole of the island. So in the name of upholding the right of one people to self-determination, another section of the population was denied their right to self-determination. And that became the essence of the problem in Northern Ireland, that if Northern Ireland had been homogeneously Protestant and Unionist, if it had been 75, 80 or 90 percent Protestant and Unionist, there really would have been no effective challenge to partition over the last century. People in the South might have railed against it and regretted it and aspired to unity, but there would have been no internal challenge. But because there was this large nationalist minority, which at the time of partition was about a third of the population as a whole, they were a permanent challenge to the existence of the state. And for a long time, uh, the polarization between unionists and nationalists, it prevented any kind of development of normal left-right or class politics. It eventually gave rise to the conflicts of the 1970s, 80s and 90s. And since the late 90s, it has caused the British government and the Irish government as a partner in, in the negotiations to set up a very unusual, almost unique set of power sharing institutions, which going back to that comment by Lewis Goodall, while the internal structures in Northern Ireland between the 1920s and the 1970s were explicitly designed to perpetuate majority rule since 1998, they have been equally explicitly designed to prevent majority rule. So that's one reason, for example, why in, in spite of the fact that you now have a Sinn Féin party, which is the largest party and which is entitled to nominate uh, their leader for the position of first minister, that doesn't have the same kind of dramatic implications that it might have had in the 1960s if a nationalist politician was to become the prime minister of the administration at Stormont, because you will still have a deputy first minister, um, which the DUP will be entitled to nominate, and which has all of the same powers as the position of first minister. It's just the symbolism of first minister versus deputy first minister. They could equally be described as co-ministers. And that may have been one reason why unionist voters resisted the appeal of the DUP in the final weeks of the campaign to, to rally behind them uh, as a way of stopping Sinn Féin from becoming the largest party, because they would have recognised that while it carries a big symbolic weight of importance, it's not going to have the sort of apocalyptic consequences that the DUP were trying to invoke during their campaign. That was Daniel Finn, who ended by explaining how the constitutional setup in Northern Ireland will limit Sinn Féin's power. And that limitation will be most dramatically demonstrated if the party's leader in the North, Michelle O'Neill, is blocked from taking the position of First Minister. That power is in the hands of the DUP, who've indicated they'll block any formation of a government without changes to the Northern Ireland Protocol. And it's in this context that Michelle O'Neill said this earlier today. And my message is clear. As Democrats... The DUP, but also the British government, must accept the, and respect the democratic outcome of this election. Brinkmanship will not be tolerated where the north of Ireland becomes collateral damage in a game of chicken with the European Commission. The responsibility for finding solutions to the protocol to make its smooth implementation lie with Boris Johnson and the EU. But make no mistake, we and our business community here will not be held to ransom. That was a pretty powerful intervention by Michelle O'Neill. And this will be an, an ongoing story. It's, it's another instance of the Tories' approach to Brexit being incredibly irresponsible when it comes to Northern Irish politics. The DUP are saying they will not form a government until the, the Northern Ireland Protocol is gone. The government is saying we want the, the Northern Ireland Protocol gone, but obviously the government agreed the Northern Ireland Protocol with the EU, so they're not in any mood to change it. It's going to be an on, on, ongoing story, which we will be covering as it develops. Mm -hmm. 